So he he called me right after he had started with the Kudai. If I'm right, I was there to establish an orthodox practice. I joined them initially as as a consultant, a principal consultant, and then we consolidated them. I think this is on. Good morning. I'd like to ask you to please take your seats because we'll be starting shortly. And because it's very early, I just want you all to confirm that you are in the place you intend to be, <laughs> which is the DNDI satellite session on nothing less than help for all essential elements um, for sustainability and elimination, uh, sustainability of access and elimination through medical innovation. Um, so, good, everyone's in the right place. I didn't see anyone get up, so that's good. Um, thank you for joining us so early in the morning. Um, there's coffee in the back of the room for anybody who needs it. Um, and we will have just one hour to go through um, a broad discussion on the essential elements for NTD control and elimination. To kick us off, I'd like to invite to the podium Dr. Luis Pizarro, Executive Director of DNDI. As he walks over, I'll tell you, he was born in Chile, trained as a medical doctor at the University of Paris. He also holds a master's degree in political sciences from Sciences Po, and an Executive Health MBA from the EHESP School of Public Health and the London School of Economics um, and the European uh, Management School. So, Luis, over to you. You know everything. All the <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you all of you for being here uh, this morning so early. Uh, I would like to start first uh, saying uh, um, happy birthday to EDCTP, of course, uh, because it's the 20th anniversary of EDCTP. Uh, and uh, the probably best gift uh, that has been uh, given to EDCTP is to have the renewal uh, of Michael as uh, director of EDCTP. I think we all agree here uh, that uh, we are very, very, First of all, happy for Michael because it's a, it's a very good recognition of the work he has been doing, but it's also a very good sign for all of us uh, that the work that has been done by EDCTP will be continue uh, and uh, the strategy, the vision uh, that Michael has been uh, given to EDCTP uh, will be pursued uh, in the future. So uh, that was definitely my first message. We're very happy at DNDI because this 20th anniversary is also echo the 20th anniversary of DNDI uh, that we have been uh, celebrating in uh, all the places uh, where the activities of DNDI uh, are uh, today in place in Latin America, in Africa. Uh, I am also sacrificing myself, I would say, next weekend running in Kenya for the 20th anniversary of DNDI. <laughs> I asked for an ambulance to be at the end. They said yes, <laughs> because I imagine how fast it's going to be. But uh, And also, of course, in Asia, uh, Japan, New York, everywhere. So uh, we are very happy, of course, to celebrate the 20th anniversary of DNDI. At the same time, we're doing the one on EDCTP. Um, to be very short and leave the time for the colleagues this morning, uh, I just wanted to insist maybe on two points. The first one uh, is that for us it's very important to have all of you in the room because every achievement we have done, uh, it's a collective achievement. And I think in DCTP and this forum, uh, it's a very good proof uh, of uh, what we can do, all of us, together uh, when funders, uh, academics, NGOs, ministries of health are able to design and to implement the programs uh, we have been doing. So we will continue uh, really to push on this partnership uh, mankind uh, and trying to keep uh, this collective work with people from all around the world. The last project we have on Dengue, uh, it's a beautiful, uh, I would say, South-South uh, collaboration between Asia, between Africa, between Latin America, and it's absolutely key uh, for the future. And the second point I wanted to insist 
is that uh, we have shown here uh, in Paris uh, that we are achieving amazing things in diseases that are extremely neglected. And sleep and sickness, our colleague uh, Olaf uh, Valverde was presenting yesterday the amazing results that have been done during years with the team here. Uh, I see Nathalie joining that has been very engaged on that and many others uh, in the room, uh, you know, to, and Olaf is arriving a little bit late, but he's here. <laughs> uh, and uh, 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 the, the results that have been presented on, on, on those diseases are absolutely amazing. Uh, and we need to continue working on that. And we were asking yesterday, and we will continue to ask, that neglected diseases stay in the top of the agenda, not only of EDCTP, but in the agenda of donors. And we fully agree that One Health, universal health coverage, etc., are very important points, uh, but we need to make people understand that neglected diseases are fully integrated into this agenda of One Health and universal health coverage. Uh, and now is not the time to give up uh, on this. The results are there, but there is much more to do to go to elimination uh, of diseases like uh, sleep and sickness, for instance. So I hope that uh, the different presentations we will have this morning on sleep and sickness, on visual leishmaniasis, on health minds, uh, will show uh, what we're able to do together. Thank you very much. Thank you, Luis. We're looking forward to the photos from Kenya. Um, and as the only Kenyan who can't run, um, I commiserate <laughs> with you. Um, you mentioned three diseases on which the NDI is working and one on which we are so close to elimination as a public health problem. And the incredible work that has been done on sleeping sickness has been led by, among others, Florent Mbo Kukumbi, who is the access leader and HAT platform coordinator at DNDI in Kinshasa. Um, Florent is also a medical doctor, unsurprisingly, uh, trained at the University of Kinshasa. He holds a, an MSc in tropical disease control from the ITM in Antwerp. And he's done health systems research at the uh, Free University of Brussels, as well as health policy work um, at the ITM. Florent, I'd like to hand over to you to share the progress that you've made and continue to make on sleeping sickness. Okay, thank you very much, uh, President. Uh, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I would like uh, to share with you the innovative uh, IRD and the building capacity carried out by the DNDI in sleeping sickness uh, through the art platform, Human African Regional Platform which is a capacity building platform for clinical and operational research created in 2005 by the Sleeping Sickness National Control Program and a research institution from the most affected endemic countries and international research institution like the NDI, which is a main sponsor FIND, Swiss TPH, ITM, IRD, LSTM, MSF, and WHO is attending uh, our meeting uh, as observer to guide on uh, research priority about uh, sleeping sickness. In the beginning of the art platform, we selected uh, some challenges about uh, sensitivity and specificity of uh, diagnostic tools, we would like to, to see how we can improve these uh, diagnostic tools. Also, how we can reduce the toxicity and the resistance of the previous treatments, including the complexity of uh, the uh, administration. I can give you an example 20 years ago, when I was a GP and a medical doctor in rural hospital, head of health district and provincial coordinator in the most affected province on sleeping sickness in Africa, many health workers were facing and dealing with uh, 
serious adverse advent events caused by uh, melarsoprol and also the administration of fexindazole. Around 56 intravenous infusion uh, managed by uh, the health worker in rural area in Africa in different endemic countries. That's why uh, all the stakeholders during uh, uh, this meeting of uh, the ad platform in the beginning uh, uh, define the target profile of the drug, the new drug, which can be effective, safe, and active for the two forms of the disease, Gambiensis and Rhodesian form of uh, sleeping sickness, active for the two stages of uh, uh, the disease, and easy to use uh, in remote area and stable in tropical setting. After uh, many years of uh, clinical research implemented by DNDI, in 2009, the first treatment was delivered. It's calling NECT nifirtimox eflornitin combination therapy. You can see uh, the progress uh, to reduce uh, from uh, 56 uh, infusion to 14 infusion. Uh, it was uh, a revolution of, uh, in the treatment of sleeping sickness. With uh, sustained funding and also partnership, uh, we continue the clinical trials uh, to have uh, to develop uh, fexinidazole, which is uh, the first oral drug uh, delivered by the NDI in 2018. Currently, the fexinidazole is now used to all endemic uh, uh, countries. We are now working uh, for the promising single dose uh, acoziborol uh, to support the elimination that uh, the acoziborol clinical trials for uh, parasitological patients is being finalized and uh, maybe uh, the dossier will be uh, submitted uh, uh, in 2026 for uh, parasitological patients. In the meantime, we are working for additional study to extend the indication of acoziborol to seropositive uh, uh, subjects, including the breastfeeding uh, women and uh, children. You know this acoziborol uh, is going uh, to be used in a test and treat strategy. Uh, we are going to do with, uh, in collaboration with ITM and IRD. That's why they are performing uh, the serological, immunological, and uh, 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 also uh, molecular tests in the field so that they can minimize uh, to treat the false uh, seropositive subject. To achieve uh, uh, this uh, result, we, we focus on capacity building. We organize many training with uh, the partnership uh, and the support of uh, many partners like uh, ITM, uh, uh, IRD, FIND, uh, and other uh, uh, partners. We organize the training for many topics. Around uh, more than uh, 1,000 people were trained in different uh, topics, in GCP, ethical review of research, the training of monitors, uh, the pre-visit of the site, how to implement the clinical strikes in remote area. It was a very experience uh, shared between uh, different endemic countries. We support uh, also ethic committee so that they can be able to analyze the research protocols in the field, in DRC, in South Sudan, in Guinea, in Central Africa. 
we organize the exchange between endemic countries uh, uh, for physician, nurse, uh, and lab technician in clinical trials to share their experience in conducting uh, clinical trials in the field. Regarding communication, we organize many international scientific meetings. Also, we produce the newsletter in which uh, uh, most of the members of the ad platform can share the result of uh, operational research and the ongoing uh, clinical trials performing in the field. To finish, I would like uh, to, to tell you thanks uh, to system committee uh, partnership and also the investment made uh, over many years we can think now it is possible uh, to, to push towards elimination of sleeping sickness. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Florent. You've highlighted um, a really impressive strategy that has been adopted by DNDI, which is in progressive um, uh, improvement of the target product profile and the products that are available for patients while at the same time taking a pragmatic approach to access and to treatment. So close to the finish line as sleeping sickness is. It's not the only disease that DNDI is working on. Um, the work that is being led by Fabiana Alves, who's the Lichman Niasis Mycetoma Cluster Director, is Midway through, I think we can say, Fabiana, in terms of looking at the portfolio of what is coming for those diseases. I wonder if you might come up and share with us the progress that you're making. And Florent, if you could join me here, um, and then we can have a panel discussion afterwards. Good morning, everybody. So shifting to another kinetoplasty, now we are talking, going to talk about leishmaniasis. And I'm going to present to you the progress we have made um, over the past years on trying to bring new treatments for patients <laughs> affected by visceral leishmaniasis, but also I'm going to talk, talk a little bit about cutaneous leishmaniasis. So leishmaniasis is not just one disease. It's a complex vector-borne disease transmitted by these tiny mosquitoes, the sand flies. Uh, which can have different clinical manifestations depending on the species of the parasite that is causing the infection. The uh, severe form visceral leishmaniasis is, is fatal if not treated. You have here the picture of this little boy with very large spleen and liver. Normally they are pancytopenic, they lose a lot of weight, and if you don't treat these patients, they are going to die. There is also the cutaneous leishmaniasis form, which can, has a very broad spectrum of presentation. It can go from single ulcers, like in this picture, you can see here, from very complicated forms. And it, although it is not a fatal disease, uh, it brings a lot of mental health disability and is associated with stigma, especially for women. As a, one of the diseases uh, that is transmitted by vectors, it is very much linked with environmental changes like deforestation, and more recently, a lot of discussions going on about how the epidemiology of the disease is, is, is changing because of climate change. It affects the poorest of the poor population on Earth. It is also prone to outbreaks, like the ones that have been clearly described in South, South Sudan on visceral leishmaniasis, and, CL outbreak in Syria more recently, and these are mainly related to displacement of population due to conflict, and also uh, more recently because of extremes of climate that also uh, favors population displacement. The numbers are um, um, underestimated, um, underreported, sorry, but WHO uh, estimates that there are about 700,000 to a million new cases that occur annually. Most of these cases are cutaneous leishmaniasis, but still there are estimations of about 50 to 90,000 uh, patients affected by visceral leishmaniasis, and half of them are children. In terms of the epidemiological context, uh, visceral leishmaniasis, the three main hotspots are in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. In Asia, 
the numbers have reduced dramatically with the impl implementation of the elimination program. And uh, last week, actually, Bangladesh has been declared the first country to validate the elimination as a public health problem uh, of visceral leishmaniasis in the country. Nevertheless, in Africa, which is today the highest uh, region with the highest burden, the number of cases remain stagnant. And it causes a lot of uh, uh, burden to the, to the populations affected by, by visceral leishmaniasis. This year, based on the um, success of the program in Asia, WHO in, uh, convened a meeting with the highest burden countries in the region. And uh, together, we developed this uh, strategic framework that is going to guide how we can implement now and start the elimination program in the region. So it's uh, quite promising, and everybody's quite motivated for this uh, phase. In Latin America, uh, the numbers have decreased slightly in the last three years, but there is high proportion of patients affected by VL and HIV, which are the most difficult patients to treat, 15%, and also remains the region with the highest fatality rate, about uh, almost 10% fatality rate in this region. For cutaneous leishmaniasis in Latin America, the numbers are stable, but in Eastern Mediterranean region, the numbers are, are quite high and increasing over, over the last years. So in the WHO NTD roadmap, VL is a disease that is targeted for elimination as a public health problem, and CL is a disease targeted for control. And clearly, it defines that access to early diagnosis and prompt and effective treatment is one of the main strategies to control and eliminate the disease. And it also defines that uh, one of the critical actions to achieve the targets is we need to develop more effective and user-friendly treatments and diagnostics for the different forms of leishmaniasis. These are the drugs that are currently available. As you can see, most of them are parenteral drugs. All of them have issues related to toxicity and they have variable efficacy in the different regions where the disease occurs. And mutefazin, which is the only oral drug that is currently available, has the uh, issue of potential teratogenicity, therefore, with some limitation of access for women of childbearing potential. So better drugs are needed. Uh, as Florent explained uh, for HAT, uh, from the beginning, the strategy on visceral leishmaniasis had the short and the long-term objectives. So in the short term, uh, what we did was to look at the drugs that were currently available and how we could improve the therapy. So combining different compounds, shortening the treatment duration, improving the safety and the efficacy of these therapies was the strategy that was used for the short term. But at the same time, there was a lot of investment by the NDI and partners to identify the new class of compounds that would really change the way these patients are treated. So this was the long-term strategy. Uh, from where we expect we're gonna be able to, to deliver this safe, effective, short course oral treatment for patients affected by VL, but at the same time having better treatments for patients affected by VL, HIV, and also those with post calazar dermal leishmaniasis. Everything we do, it is very much in partnership, uh, so it's very important that we maintain the platforms and consortiums working in the uh, endemic countries with the partners to deliver these new therapies. So in this um, image, you see here the, the whole portfolio. Each of the boxes represent one project. And what we have delivered so far, the NDI and, uh, and the partners, is uh, all the treatments that today are recommended for visceral leishmaniasis are based on research that we have done with our partners. So for Africa, first-line therapy, sodium stibogluconate with paramomycin combination. Uh, for Asia, the, the combination trials and the effectiveness trial recommending single dose ambisom and paramomycin otephosin as second line therapy. And more recently, PAHO uh, recommended the multiple dose ambisom as the first line therapy in Latin America. And uh, as well, I'm gonna show you uh, more details in the next slides. So we are very grateful that uh, last year, 2022, uh, based on funding from EDCTP, the Africa Leash Consortium, WHO released the guidelines for the treatment of patients with VL and HIV, and this is a combination of ambisom with miotefosin, uh, and PAHO released the new guidelines for the Americas where we also have the multi-dose uh, ambisom as the first-line treatment. 
So what have we done in the, in the last years that we expect could also be incorporated as, as new uh, options for patients uh, with leishmaniasis? So in, in the picture there, um, on, the, on your right, you can see all those injections. So this is the sodium-sibogronate paramomycin current therapy. It requires two injections for 17 days. It is better than the former 30 days therapy with SSG, but still we, we need to improve, right? So one of the strategies we used was to replace the toxic component of SSG with mutefosin. And uh, results of this trial, which was funded also by EDCTP in the Africa DIA Consortium uh, are out, are published. And by the end of this month, 28th to 30th of November, WHO is convening the, the guideline development group, and we expect, based on this evidence, this is going to be incorporated as one of uh, the new possible recommendations, <laughs> therapies, especially for children in Africa. And we have also conducted studies on PKDL, post calazar dermolishmanizes, both in Africa and Asia, and we expect also these new combination therapies to be uh, incorporated as possible recommendations for, for patients affected by, by these uh, diseases. But then, um, still we are talking about treatments that have limitations, and what we want is to have new therapies that really respond to the needs of the patient. So, in parallel to the work we were doing with the currently available drugs, as I said, a lot of effort was being done to identify the new compounds, the new class of compounds, which um, are going to allow us to move from these um, toxic injectable drugs that have to be given in hospitals, many times very far from the, from the houses where these patients live, to these oral safe, well-tolerated therapies that would allow the treatment to be given really uh, closer to the community. So this is the, the big change that we expect, uh, that these new oral safe treatments uh, that will respond to the needs of children, of women of childbearing potential, that combined with a point of care diagnostic test, we would be able to give this treatment really at the primary health centers. Uh, and by having the treatment closer to the communities, we can reduce the time from onset of symptoms to diagnosis and treatment, therefore reducing disability, reducing morbidity, but also breaking the cycle of transmission as the patients are the main source of infection um, for leishmaniasis. And these uh, new compounds uh, are expected to deliver new treatments not just for visceral leishmaniasis, but also for the other forms like cutaneous leishmaniasis, PKDL, and patients co-infected with HIV. So these are the different compounds that are in the pipeline. Um, as you can see, there are a number of partners that are working with the NDI on the development of these new therapies. The one that is most advanced is LXC408, which is a compound being, uh, uh, which was identified by Novartis, and we have a collaboration with Novartis for the development of this drug. Uh, and EDCTP is also uh, supporting us with the VL -ino, under the Violino Consortium. So we have started the trial in India. Uh, so far, we have 35 patients recruited both in uh, LXC408 arm and a calibrator arm with single dose ambisome, but the, uh, the results, preliminary results, look quite promising. So patients are really responding well. No fever after about a week, uh, improvement on hematological parameters, reduction of spleen, and negative test of cure. So we are waiting for the formal interning analysis that are expected very soon, but it looks like quite promising. Right, and, and very soon we also expect to start the first trial in Ethiopia. But we, we still uh, have to see how the, this compound is going to behave and whether it would be necessary to have other compounds to use in combination. That, that's why we need to have the full pipeline. In, um, and, and as you can see here, the other compounds have different mechanisms of action and are still progressing in phase one or in earlier phases of development. So by having all of this, we expect that um, using decision-making, data-driven, uh, based on each of the steps for these studies, we would be able to progress the most promising compounds. These would have to be adapted for the context of the disease in the different regions. Um, we are really working closely with regulatory authorities to be able to progress with uh, what is going to be acceptable and what is going to 
uh, be translated to early access to these patients. Also with a lot of focus on pediatric population, as I said, half of the patients are children. Um, and we are very much interested to incorporate elements from the communities throughout the whole process of, of development. One example is um, plans that we are having now to assess uh, use of contraception in women of childbearing potential in these communities. Uh, doing these clinical trials is also a very good opportunity to understand better about the host parasite interaction and how we can use biomarkers uh, to understand who are the patients that evolve to cure, relapse, and improve the design of the, the studies in the future, and also collaborating with partners for the development of the new diagnostics. So that's the message for today. Thank you so much, and thanks for all our partners and all our donors. Thank, thank you very much, Fabiana. Fabiana, could you please also join us here? Fabiana is um, presenting in, in the place of, of Professor Ahmed Musa, who's one of the partners um, from Sudan, but was unable to come for visa issues. And these continue to persist. And um, we really need to find a solution to, to this problem. Um, Fabiana has mentioned the importance of partnership, the importance of filling the pipeline. There is some good progress, um, including for special populations for children, for women of childbearing potential. And you see the difference between a disease that is close to the end and one that is still, um, we're still trying to make a way to find optimal solutions. For some of the other diseases, the challenges are even uh, more severe. Um, and I'd like to invite uh, Coralie Martin, who has the best title in the world, Professor of Parasites and Protests at the M Museum National d'Histoire Naturelle de Paris and a longtime collaborator of DNDI over 10 years, who's going to talk about the challenges facing filarial disease research. Over to you, Corinne. Thank you. Sorry for that. Okay. So, um, good morning, everybody. So, le let's go bigger. So, let's speak of worms, uh, what is naturally named ailments. And as a fundamental biologist at the Natural History Museum, I have to say that these are very di different organisms. So for me, it's very complicated to speak about elements because what I see is a lot of organisms, very different with different biology, different uh, places of living. So some are in the intestinal gut, so some others are in tissue. And that brings me to say that we may have to consider do we go for one drug for everybody, or should we go for different drugs for the different film? Because these films are so different. And the problem is that all together, they affect a lot of people, as you see. It's more than one billion. And these people also, they don't are very well, they are not very well covered in terms of going through preventive chemotherapy. These are numbers I, I, I found recently, and um, I was a bit shocked by that, I have to say. Because what you see here is that most of the people requiring preventive chemotherapy do not receive chem uh, preventive chemotherapy. And that's true for all the main uh, element infection like uh, STH, schistosomiasis, or filariasis. So speaking of therapy, what do we have in, uh, in, our, in our hands currently? Um, for nematodes, we have, as you all know, we have DEC, diethylcarbamazine, and of course ivermectin and albendazole, but also mebendazole, purantelpamoate, and tiabendazole. So these are all molecules. I mean, these so molecules we have been using for decades. And for three methods, we have also something we use for decades, like praziconfil. And for cestod, we, we have very limited <laughs> drugs with uh, niclosamine. And um, of course, all these drugs are, are, are available, are unfortunately quite suboptimal because they do not target all the larval stages. Uh, as I said before, the diversity of elements also is linked to their life cycle. They have uh, larval stages, adult stages, and what we do target is mainly adult stages, but the larval stages are very resistant and they, they can hide and they can move in the body of their host. So that's something we are not targeting at the moment. The mass drug administration has been successful 
to reduce worm burden. That's really true and that's great. But uh, it's not enough to control the, the element infection currently. And um, it, it means that moving from elimination of a public health problems to elimination of these diseases will require new tools. So currently uh, I'm working with the DNDI in a, in a health consortium uh, to establish a research and development pipeline for drugs targeting nematodes, so only nematodes, not uh, cestodes and uh, trematodes. Uh, the idea is to target the soil transmitted element and oncocerciasis. And the, the what we call HELP is the element elimination platform. It's a multidisciplinary platform <laughs> funded with a, a European fund in Horizon 2020. And the idea is to uh, go through a different uh, uh, process of drug pipeline up to a translational uh, aspect. So it's led by the Swiss TPH uh, with different partners, uh, the DNDI, pharmaceutical companies, and academic uh, groups uh, in Africa and in Europe. And just to highlight the, the, the groups inside working on filariasis, uh, the German group, the Cameron group, and <coughs> my group in Paris, we have been supported by European grants for 25 years to work on filariasis. So I'm very grateful to FP5, FP6, and FP7, and to this current uh, 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 um, a grant uh, to help us to work on, on, on nematodes. So help, uh, just to give you an overview of the project, it goes, as I said, from discovery to clinical development, so it's very large. And um, the, 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 the purpose, main purpose of HELP was to, to repurpose drugs to reduce, of course, the cost and the attrition rates. And by maintaining a, a drug development pipeline, which has been really difficult. Um, and now there is a new project which has, been, which has started this year. It's named eWorm, so enabling the WHO roadmap shifting the drug development paradigm and to, to set up basket trials to increase the output and reduce cost. And also uh, targeting more uh, nematode uh, diseases, including loiasis and mansonellasis, which are really neglected diseases in elements uh, fields. So the idea behind that is to, to repurpose drug. I mean, mainly it's only this, repurposing drugs. And all comes, I would say, from the veterinary collaboration. That's, that's very one health context because we, we, we use a lot what has been done in the vet veterinary field, which is logical because ailments in, in cattle and in, in, in pets is really important and the pharmaceutical, veterinary pharmaceutical companies put a lot of effort on this. Uh, so why not using them and you know, working with them? And that was, has been done at least to target uh, filariasis and STH. Um, so that's what we have been doing these years and still doing now. So the, the, the repositioning of emodepside and oxfendazole has been the key uh, project which has been done under HELP and we, we, are, during, we are done during uh, eWorm now. Uh, but I would say if this is uh, 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 very limited, unfortunately. Uh, we, we do not have much more. And we also have some uh, uh, works on uh, Volbachia. So for those who may not be familiar with Volbachia, it's an endobacteria present in filariae. And it's a mutualist. So if you target the bacteria, if you kill the bacteria, you will kill the worm. So that's another option also to access to to, to find a way to, 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 to solve the filariasis. So uh, for filarial now, we, the pipeline is, uh, as, I, as you see here, unfortunately for, for, the, for the research, there is no pipeline available. What we have done is many uh, lead optimization for slow wine inhibitors. Uh, now with eWorm, we have a, a, a strong uh, uh, project on translational uh, analysis with different compounds, uh, as you see, many emodepsine and oxfandazole. And uh, the more you go to development and implantation, the less you have for the moment, but it will come, it will come. So from help to eworm, I would say we, we are going through the same problems with uh, elements, so no drug pipeline, no investment into R&D, unfortunately, no disease mapping, no resistance tracing. So what has been done by the vets, I mean, we have a very good overview of a resistance with anti-elmantic. 
but we need to go further with human and to plan this. Um, another problem is the financial burden of MDA, of course, and um, also to, to use mass treatment with non-curative compounds. So, of course, drug development is expensive and risky. We all know that. Um, and we know also why it doesn't go through all the, the to the end. I mean, we, we have a lot of lack of clinical efficacy, uh, problem with toxicity, poor pharmacokinetic profile, and of course, lack of commercial interest. I would say in elements, it's really important this. Um, so to conclude, I would say we have a, a strong network of partners, but we are facing numerous challenges. And uh, what I highlight is, I think, are the most important challenges. I would definitely say, don't forget that these worms are complex and they require maybe very likely complex intervention strategy to obtain control because of their life cycles. Uh, there is a limited efficacy of current drugs, uh, which is an also another big issue. The risk of anti-almantic drug resistance should be taken in account, definitely. Uh, there is a lot of remaining hotspot of persistent transmission even if uh, the, the drugs used can, can, can do their job. And then we have a problem of drug availability. And I would say the most important thing is that new drugs are needed, new targets are needed, sorry. And that's for the negative part, but I would like to finish with a positive thing, is that we have a lot of highly skilled and committed partners and clinical networks. They have been working for many, many years. They know them, they know each other very well, and they know what they are working for. So let's use that. Um, thank you, everybody. I would just thank the, the partners and donors for this is for help, and this is for eWorms, which is the new one. Thank you very much. Thank you, Coralie. If you could also please join us. So you've heard um, the full spectrum of investment, which has yielded very good results and, 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 and exciting prospects of elimination of disease. And on the other hand, diseases that have no prospects almost at all at the moment, uh, given the level of investment and also the state of um, science. We know that R&D for neglected tropical diseases is being buttressed by EDCTP, by bilateral giving from countries like Germany, France, and Spain, and the UK, but it requires much, much more, as you can see, in a broader range of investors. It also requires um, that as priorities shift as, um, to focusing on climate-driven issues, um, other new technologies that are exciting for other parts of health, like the use of AI and treatment, et cetera, that we somehow retain a focus on the importance of investing in R&D for neglected tropical diseases. And it requires evidence um, of the impact that is being achieved in order to push policymakers to continue to invest. And some work is underway in this area. There is an evidence for impact project being led by Policy Cures Research, which is trying to document backwards and forwards what has been achieved. We have heard from our presenters that no one stakeholder will do it all. Um, deep and broad partnerships are required to achieve progress and uh, to sustain success. So as I turn to you to pose your questions and to engage in the discussion with our speakers, I'd also like to make a plaidoyer for everyone to act as an advocate for continued investment in research and development for neglected tropical diseases and for the people they affect, many of whom are children. So I don't know if there are burning questions to start. And otherwise, while people are warming up, maybe I'll go to you, Juliette, from Policy Cures to tell us about what Policy Cures research is looking at and evidence for impact. Thanks so much, Spring. Uh, so my name is Julia Bori. Uh, I'm a senior analyst from... <laughs> um, two things, Juliet. G give the microphone a chance. They're going to give you a new one. And if you could just stand up so everyone can see who you are. Does this one? Yeah, that works better. Um, so good morning, everyone. My name is Julia Bori. I'm a senior analyst at Policy Cures Research. 
I'll try to give a brief overview of the Evidence for Impact project. It's an ambitious project we've undertaken with a lot of different partners uh, um, and a lot of different moving parts. But essentially, we are trying to assess the health and economic impact of the investment in global health R&D for the last 20 years by building a base of evidence while also co-creating a framework of different indicators that can be used to better inform decision making um, by having a better understanding of the impact moving forward. Um, and so looking at kind of the things that have come up, we've recently launched an updated infectious disease pipeline tracker. Um, so that includes all of the investigational candidates for neglected diseases and emerging infectious diseases. It also includes all of the approved products that have been registered since 1999 and maps out the WHO R&D priorities. Um, so coming up next, we'll be um, launching on the sidelines of WHA next year the kind of the full suite of evidence and tools uh, uh, for this project. Uh, um, so that will include the uh, indicator uh, framework as well as the results of the health and economic impact studies. Um, and really what the expectation is um, that by having these different um, tools, this different evidence, we'll be not only able to um, look back on 20 years of investment and show the return, show the benefits, um, but out that also moving forward, we'll be able to make better decisions um, about how we use our resources and really demonstrate that impact. Um, thank you. Thanks. Any, any questions or comments for our speakers? It's early, but it's not that early. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot see very well from here, so... Oui. <laughs> Vas-y, Nathalie. <laughs> Hello. So, of course, congratulations on all of that. I, I wonder if you, especially Coralie, you mentioned the animals. How are we going to move forward with animal health and the connection between the animals and, and, and humans in the field of worms or others, in fact, leash and possibly hat? I can only speak for worms, but I think it could be uh, enlarged to the other disease. I think the when I, when I speak with my vet colleagues for Philae, um, what I see is that we have uh, different pipelines and what we are doing now is only reusing their pipelines. So, I mean, Benzimidazole, it has all been done in vet, uh, vet uh, medicine. So, what we may learn from them is, all, I'm thinking about resistance, is that they have done a lot of genetical work and so they, they, for example, for, for benzimidazole, they have done a lot of work about on microtubules to know where we can expect some resistance when the drug is doing its job. So that's something we may learn from them to go faster. I would say there is the same problem for nematodes with people who do some free-living nematodes. If you speak with people who do uh, uh, parasitic plant nematodes, they know much more about the biology of the worms, how they move, how they sense their environment, so they know much more about the receptor we need to target. The same for say elegance. So, you know, it's it's exactly that. We we need to learn from the other fields, definitely, and not stay together only on the aspect of humans. That's my feeling. It's it's very one wealth, one elf. It's the idea of one elf. And I would say there is another thing. I mean, we, we, we speak of vet and, and human. Don't forget the environment if you mm. speak of One Health. And we also need to include in the next pipeline for anti helminthic the consequences of anti helminthic what is going to, I mean, if we treat with so much anti helminthic what will be the consequences on that? Um, just to highlight that we have a lot of um, soil issues due to anti helminthic Soil sterilization due to anti It's not only uh, antibiotic resistance we should speak of. So that's why we need to discuss with many partners. Is there anyone from vet medicine in the room? Agricultural science. Yeah, maybe that's uh, one way of pushing forward this agenda of involved, uh, involving other sectors. I see a hand. 
and one in the back as well. Uh, good morning, Philippe Guérin, University of Oxford. Um, question, I will take the example of uh, Vishal Leshmaniazis and maybe a question for Fabiana. Uh, we are starting having a problem in VL in, re in regards to recruitment of patients. Uh, first, because in Asia, uh, there are so few patients that recruitment is getting difficult. And in East Africa, the security concerns makes it also very difficult. What is your reflections around different design and different approaches to do clinical trials, which will be probably a bit different from the classical approach of recruiting in one site or two sites or even multiple sites? Patients, what can we do about that? Because that's going to be probably a major barrier in the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, ver very good uh, point of discussion, Philippe. And um, so indeed, the context of the disease is quite different in the different regions, right? So starting from uh, South Asia, today we are doing this clinical trial there. Uh, and impressively, the partners are really, they have really uh, different mechanisms to try to identify patients. So we've been able to recruit uh, a number of patients, but we acknowledge that Probably for the next phase, this is a first phase two trial where we're expecting to recruit 100 patients. But for the next phase, for the phase three, you know, what part of the discussions we are having is whether we would need to have a comparative trial, what would be the design that we are going to use. And in fact, part of the discussion we are having is really with the Philippe's team to see how we can utilize information uh, from uh, historical data from patients that are being treated currently with the standard of care, single dose ambisome, and see if we can reduce the number of patients that would have to be recruited in future trials in South Asia. And of course, this is part of what we are, um, we, we would uh, really try to seek to have support to collect more of this data prospectively uh, so then we would be in a better position when we have to do the, the next phase of the trial. And of course, very much um, aligned with what would be the discussions with the regulatory agencies. In the case of Africa, um, indeed, it's um, the situation, for example, in Sudan today, it's not possible to do trials there. But at the same time, our colleagues from South Sudan now come to us and say, hey, why don't we start to, to think about doing trials in South Sudan, right? So I think the uh, context now of planning to have this starting of the elimination program in the region is also going to be a very good opportunity to bring more partners and to bring um, other groups that have not been involved in clinical trials in implementing these clinical trials. So part of the uh, main uh, strategies in the very beginning is going to be how we can improve access to diagnosis and treatment. So there is likely going to be a lot of active case search. As we know, anytime you go to the field, you're going to find more patients. So what we are discussing with WHO, with End Fund, and with the other partners in the, in the region is that we will need really to synchronize the activities that are going to be undertaken by the elimination program with the R&D activities. Mm -hmm. And we are also expecting that we would be able to increase the network of clinical trial sites, which of course would increase the capacity to do clinical research in the region and increase the number of people who you know, would participate uh, in these types of activities. So we need to be creative, um, but I think together uh, we can, we can <coughs> deliver. Yeah. Thanks, Fabiana. I see a question in the back, and then I have a question about involving communities. Oh, thank you very much for the nice light at the end of the tunnel, but I think possibly uh, my worry is about the owner of the disease who has been a guest in the room of this product development, and that is the African government. 20 years of DNDI has been good. They have shown we can develop this product at a lower cost, but all work is happening outside the continent. How do we get the African government and the early development and the whole cascade happening in the South? I think that should be the next big job because the African government cannot afford to be guests in solutions for their problems. I think this has gone for too long, so I don't know what you think about it. Thanks, Bernard, for uh, challenging us now to have a very different kind of conversation. Just to say, though, in DNDI is very much an African organization in the sense that Kemri um, was 
it was in Mombasa that DNDI was actually born and it was the medical research institutes of affected countries that actually pushed for the establishment of, of DNDI. So if we know that the medical research institutes, many of which are governmental entities, are involved, what is missing is not government so much as the financiers from government, right? So maybe I put the question back to you. What do medical research institutes in affected countries need to do to persuade those who hold the money to release it for R&D for NTDs? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you put your hand back up, so let's have that, and then I see a hand over here. Thank you for, for the great presentations. Uh, to uh, come back to the point that you that to emphasize I would like to present our institutions. We, we are in Cameroon. Uh, we, are, we work in the High Institute for Science Research. Uh, for many years, we've been participating at these forums. And uh, all the development, uh, even uh, the phase one, are done in Western So we've been thinking that for some drugs that would be exclusively used in Africa, it would be good that some of these phase one trials are done in, in Africa. And that's why we, for about 20 years now, we've made efforts to try to set up a clinical trial site for phase one. So it is there. So what we are trying to do now is to network and try to create well-established phase one trial centers to help us for uh, personal training and also to accompany us so that we can could participate in well-equipped, well, uh, well-established phase one site to try to do some of these phase one trials in Africa. We are based on the Merriweather Prize, 500,000 euros. That's uh, the money we use to build this site. And we are networking with people who have phase one site to help us continue this, this effort. Thank you. Thank you very much, and congratulations on the Mayor Yusad uh, Prize. <laughs> Bernard, your hand shot back up, so let me give it back to you. I think possibly it might require a bit of time, but I think it is the time the African scientists working with the African research institutions walk with the NDI, means to put some money on the table. It might be small, but I think it's a walk we need to put effort on and start going, because I think it is timely, and I think that could be the next revolution that the NDI can do in the next 20 years for this. Please. Yeah, Fabiana. Yes, I think this is quite relevant and a very important point, uh, Professor Ogutu, and I think that the platforms are really a place where this type of discussions happen. And more and more, like recently, we had participation of all the highest endemic countries in, in the Lishmaniasis platform. In the government is there. And you can see signals of more uh, interest to bring domestic funds, to bring uh, you know, m a lot of ownership on the program. And I think the very important thing is to make this bridge between the academic institutions, we, the ones who are doing research and development, together with the policymakers, together with the ministries of health, the national control programs, because um, also we need them to roll out all these activities that we are doing, and later on, of course, adopting and having access, you know, guaranteed to the patient. So, I think this is part of what uh, we are already doing, and we have to probably improve and reinforce um, over the, the coming uh, years. Thanks, Fabiana. One last question or comment before I wrap up. Yes, please go ahead. Just one co comment on uh, the phase one units. Uh, Farm of South Africa is a unit with uh, 49 years experience. We've done 3,000 clinical trials. We'll be happy to extend our knowledge to, to Africa for the phase one work. Thank you. Excellent. <laughs> yeah. So we have just two more. Olaf, did you want to say something? Yeah, please go ahead. 
That's it, Mike. Okay, thanks. This could be actually a question to you, Spring. Uh, there was some years ago, there was a lot of, of efforts towards the uh, R&D treaty. Uh, can, can you tell us uh, what's the situation now? Hmm. How much time do you have? Okay, um, <laughs> the, the short story is the, the uh, model that was proposed for the treaty was passively uh, rejected by, by countries for different reasons. Um, some did not like the the uh, design and the allocation of you know who should pay what um, into um, investments in R and D. Others had issues with intellectual property questions around the R and D treaty. Where it is being revived to some degree is in the negotiations around the pandemic treaty. Um, there are elements on on R and D that are in there, and there are elements of investment that are in there. But again, it's the focus is quite strictly on diseases of pandemic potential. Not that any of us can predict exactly what those diseases are, but nevertheless, that's that's where the policy discussions are at the moment. There is discussion. If we take the African continent, there is discussion about this new public health order and uh, mobilization of resources from on the continent to drive um, a, a new health reality, including for research and development. There is the African Pharmaceutical Manufacturing, no, R&D Fund, which is being proposed um, sitting in the African Development Bank, which is a new locus, and I think also new partners uh, um, for this community to consider interaction with is the development banks and the financiers of, of the various countries. So that work is being led through the African Union and its agencies. Um, and the payment for infrastructure development will be done through a Frexim Bank, the Africa Export Impa Import Bank. But they will only invest in those things that they know have been articulated as priorities. So the challenge is for this community to articulate quite strongly the need for investment in research and development, in clinical trials, in clinical infrastructure development, and so on, and, and in access also at the end of the day, as well as um, the interest in One Health and planetary health, which are um, priorities given the impact that we're already seeing of the climate crisis in Africa. So that's the shortest possible answer I can give to that, and I'll stop there. Okay, we're on time, and I think we have to stop the discussion. Thank you all very much for having joined us. Thank you to our excellent panelists. Thank you, Luis. And I'm sure all of you will be running wherever you are, and otherwise cheering Luis on for his run in Kenya. Thanks, bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you. Excellent. You are such a good facilitator. Oh, you. We'd love to get a photo of you before you all leave okay. uh, uh, by the banner.